Living Beautifully with Uncertainty and Change Written by Pema Chodron Read by San Naomi Kier Schultz August 6th, 2022 The Overview Living is a form of not being sure, not knowing what next or how. The moment you know how, you begin to die a little. The artist never entirely knows. We guess. We may be wrong, but we take leap after leap in the dark. Quote by Agnes de Mille. One, the fundamental ambiguity of being human. Quote, life is like stepping into a boat that is about to sail out to sea and sink. End quote. Shunryu Suzuki Roshi. As human beings, we share a tendency to scramble for certainty whenever we realize that everything around us is in flux. In difficult times, the stress of trying to find solid ground, something predictable and safe to stand on, seems to intensify. But in truth, the very nature of our existence is forever in flux. Everything keeps changing, whether we are aware of it or not. What a predicament. We seem doomed to suffer simply because we have a deep-seated fear of how things really are. Our attempts to find lasting pleasure, lasting security, are at odds with the fact that we are part of a dynamic system in which everything and everyone is in process. So this is where we find ourselves, right in the middle of a dilemma, and it leaves us with some provocative questions. How can we live wholeheartedly in the face of impermanence, knowing that one day we are going to die? What is it like to realize we can never completely and finally get it all together? Is it possible to increase our tolerance for instability and change? How can we make friends with unpredictability and uncertainty and embrace them as vehicles to transform our lives? The Buddha called impermanence one of the three distinguishing marks of our existence, an incontrovertible fact of life, but it's something we seem to resist pretty strongly. We think that if only we did this or didn't do that, somehow we could achieve a secure, dependable, controllable life. How disappointed we are when things don't work out quite the way we planned. Not long ago, I read an interview with the war correspondent Chris Hedges in which he used a phrase that seemed like a perfect description of our situation. Quote, the moral ambiguity of human existence, end quote. This refers, I think, to an essential choice that confronts us all, whether to cling to the false security of our fixed ideas and tribal views, even though they bring us only momentary satisfaction, or to overcome our fear and make the leap to living an authentic life. That phrase, the moral ambiguity of human existence, resonated strongly with me because it's what I've been exploring for years. How can we relax and have a genuine, passionate relationship with the fundamental uncertainty, the groundlessness of being human? My first teacher, Chogyam Trumpa, used to talk about the fundamental anxiety of being human. This anxiety, or queasiness in the face of impermanence, isn't something that afflicts just a few of us. It's an all-pervasive state that human beings share. But rather than being disheartened by the ambiguity, the uncertainty of life, what if we accepted it and relaxed into it? What if we said yes? This is the way it is. This is what it means to be human, and decided to sit down and enjoy the ride. Happily, the Buddha gave many instructions on how to do just this. Among these instructions are what are known in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition as the three vows, or three commitments. These are three methods for embracing the chaotic, unstable, dynamic, challenging nature of our situation as a path to awakening. The first of the commitments, traditionally called the Pratimoksha vow, is the foundation for personal liberation. This is a commitment to doing our best to not cause harm with our actions or words or thoughts, a commitment to being good to each other. It provides a structure within which we learn to work with our thoughts and emotions and to refrain from speaking or acting out of confusion. The next step toward being comfortable with groundlessness is a commitment to helping others. Traditionally called the bodhisattva vow, it is a commitment 
to dedicate our lives to keeping our hearts and minds open and to nurturing our compassion with the longing to ease the suffering of the world. The last of the three commitments, traditionally known as the Samaya vow, is a resolve to embrace the world just as it is, without bias. It is a commitment to see everything we encounter, good and bad, pleasant and painful, as a manifestation of awakened energy. It is a commitment to see anything and everything as a means by which we can awaken further. But what does the fundamental ambiguity of being human mean in terms of day-to-day -day life? Above all, it means understanding that everything changes. As Shantideva, an 8th century Buddhist master, wrote in The Way of the Bodhisattva, All that I possess and use is like the fleeting vision of a dream. It fades into the realms of memory, and fading will be seen no more. Whether we are conscious of it or not, the ground is always shifting. Nothing lasts, including us. There are probably very few people who at any given time are consumed with the idea, I'm going to die. But there is plenty of evidence that this thought, this fear, haunts us constantly. I, too, am a brief and passing thing, observed Shantideva. So what does it feel like to be human in this ambiguous, groundless state? For one thing, we grab at pleasure and try to avoid pain, but despite our efforts, we are always alternating between the two. Under the illusion that experiencing constant security and well-being is the ideal state, we do all sorts of things to try to achieve it. Eat, drink, drug, work too hard, spend hours online or watching TV, but somehow we never quite achieve the state of unwavering satisfaction we are seeking. At times we feel good, physically nothing hurts and mentally all is well, and then it changes and we're hit with physical pain or mental anguish. I imagine it would even be possible to chart how pleasure and pain alternate in our lives, hour by hour, day after day, year in and year out, first one and then the other predominating. But it's not impermanence per se, or even knowing we are going to die that is the cause of our suffering, the Buddha taught. Rather, it's our resistance to the fundamental uncertainty of our situation. Our discomfort arises from all of our efforts to put ground under our feet, to realize our dream of constant okayness. When we resist change, it's called suffering, but when we can completely let go and not struggle against it, when we can embrace the groundlessness of our situation and relax into its dynamic quality, that is called enlightenment, or awakening to our true nature, to our fundamental goodness. Another word for this is freedom. Freedom from struggling against the fundamental ambiguity of being human. What the fundamental ambiguity of being human points to is that as much as we want to, we can never say, this is the only true way. This is how it is. End of discussion. In his interview, Chris Hedges also talked about the pain that ensues when a group or religion insists that its view is the one true view. As individuals, we too have plenty of fundamentalist tendencies. We use them to comfort ourselves. We grab onto a position or belief as a way of neatly explaining reality, unwilling to tolerate the uncertainty and discomfort of staying open to other possibilities. We cling to that position as our personal platform and become very dogmatic about it. The root of these fundamentalist tendencies, these dogmatic tendencies, is a fixed identity, a fixed view we have of ourselves as good or bad, worthy or unworthy, this or that. With a fixed identity, we have to busy ourselves with trying to rearrange reality because reality does not always conform to our view. When I first came to Gampo Abbey, I thought of myself as a likable, flexible, open-hearted, open-minded person. Part of that was true, but there was another part that wasn't. For one thing, I was a terrible director. The other residents felt disempowered by me. They pointed out my shortcomings, but I could not hear what they were saying because my fixed identity was so strong. Every time new people came to live at the Abbey, I got the same kind of negative feedback, but still, I didn't hear it. This went on for a few years, and then, one day, as if they had all gotten together and staged an intervention, I finally heard 
what everyone had been telling me about how my behavior was affecting them. At last, the message got through. That's what it means to be in denial. You can't hear anything that doesn't fit into your fixed identity. Even something positive, that you're kind or you did a great job or you have a wonderful sense of humor, is filtered through this fixed identity. You can't take it in unless it's already part of your self-definition. In Buddhism, we call the notion of a fixed identity ego-clinging. It's how we try to put solid ground under our feet in an ever-shifting world. Meditation practice starts to erode that fixed identity. As you sit, you begin to see yourself with more clarity and you notice how attached you are to your opinions about yourself. Often, the first blow to the fixed identity is precipitated by a crisis. When things start to fall apart in your life, as they did in mine when I came to Gumpo Abbey, you feel as if your whole world is crumbling. But actually, it's your fixed identity that's crumbling. And as Chogyam Trumpa used to tell us, that is cause for celebration. The purpose of the spiritual path is to unmask, to take off our armor. When that happens, it feels like a crisis because it is a crisis, a fixed identity crisis. The Buddha taught that the fixed identity is the cause of our suffering. Looking deeper, we could say that the real cause of suffering is not being able to tolerate uncertainty and thinking that it's perfectly sane, perfectly normal to deny the fundamental groundlessness of being human. Ego clinging is our means of denial. Once we have the fixed idea, this is me, then we see everything as a threat or a promise. As a threat or a promise, or something we couldn't care less about. Whatever we encounter, we're either attracted to it or averse to it or indifferent to it, depending on how much of a threat to our self-image it represents. The fixed identity is our false security. We maintain it by filtering all of our experience through this perspective. When we like someone, it's generally because they make us feel good. They don't blow our trip, don't disturb our fixed identity. So we're buddies. When we don't like someone, they're not on our wavelength, so we don't want to hang out with them. It's generally because they challenge our fixed identity. We are uncomfortable in their presence because they don't confirm us in the ways we want to be confirmed, so we can't function in the ways we want to function. Often, we think of the people we don't like as our enemies, but in fact, they are all important to us. They are our greatest teachers, special messengers who show up just when we need them to point out our fixed identity. The discomfort associated with groundlessness, with the fundamental ambiguity of being human, comes from our attachment to wanting things to be a certain way. The Tibetan word for attachment is shenpa. My teacher, Zigar Krongshul, calls shenpa the barometer of ego clinging, a gauge of our self-involvement and self-importance. Shenpa has a visceral quality associated with grasping or conversely pushing away this is the feeling of I like, I want, I need, and I don't like, I don't want, I don't need, I want it to go away. I think of Shenpa as being hooked. It's that stuck feeling, that tightening or closing down or withdrawing we experience when we are uncomfortable with what is going on. Shenpa is also the urge to find relief from those feelings by clinging to something that gives us pleasure. Anything can trigger our clinging, our attachments, Someone criticizes our work or looks at us the wrong way. The dog chews our favorite shoes. We spill on our best tie. One minute we are feeling fine and then something happens. And suddenly we are hooked into anger, jealousy, blame, recrimination, or self-doubt. This discomfort, this sense of being triggered because things are not right, because we want them to last longer or to go away, is the felt experience, the visceral experience of the fundamental ambiguity of being human. For the most part, our attachment, our shenpa, arises involuntarily, our habitual response to feeling insecure. When we are hooked, we turn to anything to relieve the discomfort. Food, alcohol, sex, shopping, being critical or unkind. But there is something more fruitful we can do when that edgy feeling arises. It's similar to the way we can deal with pain. One popular way of relating to physical pain is mindfulness meditation. It involves directing your full attention to the pain and breathing in and out of the spot that hurts. 
Instead of trying to avoid the discomfort, you open yourself completely to it. You become receptive to the painful sensation without dwelling on the story your mind has concocted. It's bad. I shouldn't feel this way. Maybe it'll never go away. When you contact the all-worked-up feeling of Shinpa, the basic instruction is the same as in dealing with physical pain. Whether it's a feeling of I like or I don't like, or an emotional state like loneliness, depression, or anxiety, you open yourself fully to the sensation, free of interpretation. If you've tried this approach with physical pain, you know that the result can be quite miraculous. When you give your full attention to your knee, or your back, or your head, whatever hurts, and drop the good or bad right-wrong storyline, and simply experience the pain directly for even a short time, then your ideas about the pain, and often the pain itself, will dissolve. Shanti Deva said the suffering we experience with physical pain is entirely conceptual. It comes not from the sensation itself, but from how we view it. He used the example of the Karna, a sect in ancient India in which the members burned and cut themselves as part of their ritual practice. They associated the extreme pain with spiritual ecstasy, so it had a positive meaning for them. Many athletes experience something similar when they feel the burn. The physical sensation in itself is neither good nor bad. It's our interpretation of it that makes it so. I'm reminded of something that happened when my daredevil son was about 12 years old. We were standing on a tiny platform on the prow of a large ship, kind of like Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet in the movie Titanic, and I started to describe to him my fear of heights. I told him I wasn't sure if I could stay there, that I was having all sorts of physical sensations and my legs were turning to mush. I'll never forget the look on his face when he said, Mom, that's exactly what I feel. The difference is that he loved that feeling. All of my nieces and nephews are bungee jumpers and spelunkers and enjoy adventures that I avoid at any cost just because I have an aversion to the same feeling that gives them a thrill. But there's an approach we can take to the fundamental ambiguity of being human that allows us to work with rather than retreat from feelings like fear and aversion. If we can get in touch with the sensation as sensation and open ourselves to it without labeling it good or bad, then even when we feel the urge to draw back, we can stay present and move forward into the feeling. In my stroke of insight, the brain scientist Jill Bolt Taylor's book about her recovery from a massive stroke, she explains the physiological mechanism behind emotion. An emotion like anger, that's an automatic response, lasts just 90 seconds from the moment it's triggered until it runs its course. One and a half minutes, that's all. When it lasts any longer, which it usually does, it's because we have chosen to rekindle it. The fact of the shifting, changing nature of our emotions is something we could take advantage of. But do we? No. Instead, when an emotion comes up, we fuel it with our thoughts, and what should last one and a half minutes may be drawn out for ten or twenty years. We just keep recycling the storyline. We keep strengthening our old habits. Most of us have physical or mental conditions that have caused us distress in the past, and when we get a whiff of one coming, an incipient asthma attack, a symptom of chronic fatigue, a twinge of anxiety, we panic. Instead of relaxing with the feeling and letting it do its minute and a half while we're fully open and receptive to it, we say, oh no, oh no, here it is again. We refuse to feel fundamental ambiguity when it comes in this form, so we do the thing that will be most detrimental to us. We rev up our thoughts about it. What if this happens? What if that happens? We stir up a lot of mental activity. Body, speech, and mind become engaged in running away from the feeling, which only keeps it going and going and going. We can counter this response by training and being present. A woman who was familiar with Jill Bolt Taylor's observation about the duration of emotion sent me a letter describing what she does when an uneasy feeling comes up. I just do the one and a half minute thing, she wrote. So, that's a good practice instruction. When you contact groundlessness, one way to deal with that edgy, queasy feeling is to do the one and a half minute thing. Acknowledge the feeling. Give it your full, compassionate, even welcoming attention, and even if it's only for a few seconds, drop the storyline about the feeling. 
This allows you to have a direct experience of it, free of interpretation. Don't fuel it with concepts or opinions about whether it's good or bad. Just be present with the sensation. Where is it located in your body? Does it remain the same for very long? Does it shift and change? Ego, or fixed identity, doesn't just mean we have a fixed idea about ourselves. It also means that we have a fixed idea about everything we perceive. I have a fixed idea about you. You have a fixed idea about me. And once there is that feeling of separation, it gives rise to strong emotions. In Buddhism, strong emotions like anger, craving, pride, and jealousy are known as kleshas, conflicting emotions that cloud the mind. The kleshas are our vehicle for escaping groundlessness, and therefore, every time we give in to them, our pre-existing habits are reinforced. In Buddhism, going around and around recycling the same patterns is called samsara, and samsara equals pain. We keep trying to get away from the fundamental ambiguity of being human, and we can't. We can't escape it any more than we can escape change, any more than we can escape death. The cause of our suffering is our reaction to the reality of no escape, ego clinging, and all the trouble that stems from it, all the things that make it difficult for us to be comfortable in our own skin and get along with one another. If the way to deal with those feelings is to stay present with them without fueling the storyline, then it begs the question, how do we get in touch with the fundamental ambiguity of being human in the first place? In fact, it's not difficult because underlying uneasiness is usually present in our lives. It's pretty easy to recognize, but not so easy to interrupt. We may experience this uneasiness as anything from slight edginess to sheer terror. Anxiety makes us feel vulnerable, which we generally don't like. Vulnerability comes in many guises. We may feel off balance as if we don't know what's going on, don't have a handle on things. We may feel lonely or depressed or angry. Most of us want to avoid emotions that make us feel vulnerable, so we will do almost anything to get away from them. But if, instead of thinking of these feelings as bad, we could think of them as road signs or barometers that tell us we are in touch with groundlessness, then we would see the feelings for what they really are, the gateway to liberation, an open doorway to freedom from suffering, the path to our deepest well-being and joy. We have a choice. We can spend our whole life suffering because we can't relax with how things really are. Or we can relax and embrace the open-endedness of the human situation, which is fresh, unfixated, unbiased. So, the challenge is to notice the emotional tug of Shenpa when it arises and to stay with it for one and a half minutes without the storyline. Can you do this once a day? or many times throughout the day as the feeling arises. This is the challenge. This is the process of unmasking, letting go, opening, the mind and the heart. This has been Living Beautifully with Uncertainty and Change. Chapter 1. The Fundamental Ambiguity of Being Human. Written by Pema Chodron. Read by Sen Naomi Kier Schultz. August 6th, 2022.